Um, what I want to do, and, and, and what my talk has been entitled, um, has to do with the efficient system of free public schools language being a sort of stepchild uh, of this now almost 40 year long litigation in New Jersey over education and, and its funding. Um, and I think it's fair to say that although the court has invoked regularly uh, the phrase thorough and efficient education as if it's almost one hyphenated word, in truth, I think the attention of the court increasingly has been directed to the, the word thorough and, and a word which actually doesn't appear in the Constitution at all, the word edu education. So I think if most of you who follow these things were to think about what has been the front and center constitutional dimension of the case, uh, it's now, I think, surely the requirement that the state provide all its students with a thorough education. Um, and, and it's occurred to me that it really is time, and probably overdue, to give more organized attention to the stepchild, um, the efficient system of free public schools. Um, and that uh, the way to do that, paradoxically, uh, may be to read the phrase, hmm, I did something, but... Ah, okay. It's even fancier than I thought it was going to be. Um, so the paradox is to um, think about how to give content to this phrase, efficient system of free public schools. Uh, and it, I wound up concluding that one might want to read it backwards. That is, if you think conceptually about what the framers of the Constitution may have had in mind, it seemed to me, on reflection, that they were talking about using free public schools as the basic building blocks of the state public education program. Um, and then, working backwards, the next word that appears is system. So that one would think that these free public schools, of which we have literally thousands, um, need to uh, function uh, and be structured as a unified system uh, available to educate all students. Um, and um, as the slide indicates, th these are words drawn from a variety of court decisions, which in turn are drawn from uh, the biggest and most current dictionary that courts have been able to find. Um, and I have to detour a little and tell you that uh, we teach law students and, and lawyers are imbued with the idea that if you want to give content to a constitutional provision or a statutory provision, for that matter, to a contract, you start with the plain meaning of the words that were used. Um, and then you may embellish and, and deepen your understanding by looking beyond that. Um, and so what is the plain meaning of the word system? Um, and uh, although there are elaborate definitions, I've tried to synthesize them, um, because what system seems to embody is the notion of functionality, of relationship among the parts, of organization, of coordination, of interconnection, of interdependence. Um, and, and it's not too early to plant the seeds of what I want to uh, get us to, which is, well, how does New Jersey in, on the ground, so to speak, in practice, comport with the intention and meaning of the constitutional requirements? Uh, would we say that the free public schools in New Jersey constitute a system characterized by functionality, uh, interdependence, uh, connection, coordination, um, and the like. And as you ponder that, um, I think it becomes quickly apparent that if that is to happen, if it is happening, um, it's a function largely of the State Education Department. Because we know from Abbott and we know from a lot of other things 
that legally, constitutionally, I would say practically, to have a state system of free public schools uh, requires uh, active um, leadership by the responsible state entity. Um, and it's well understood that uh, among the various levels of government, starting with the federal government, through the state, through localities, the ultimate responsibility for education is a state responsibility. Um, that could not have been made clearer um, uh, than it was in the Robinson against Cahill litigation where the primary issue was funding. And the court said um, the state is ultimately responsible for the funding of its schools and for the effective operation of the schools. Uh, local districts can be authorized to discharge some of that responsibility. If they're unable or unwilling to do it, the state has ultimate responsibility to intervene. Um, and, and so free public schools are the basic building blocks. They have to be organized in uh, and function as a system. And that fish system has to be efficient. And what does efficient mean? Well, uh, e efficiency seems to connote that we want to maximize the output or outcome uh, in relation to the input. And the most obvious input is dollars. But um, over the years, people looking at these issues have said, well, but it's more complicated. There are other kinds of inputs. There are students, there are teachers, there are books, there are school buildings. Um, but, and, and that the likeliest way to think about outcome, oversimplified but likely, is, is student achievement. And probably student achievement primarily measured by the state testing system. So the question is, um, how do we get the most bang for the buck? How do we get the best and largest output from the large input of dollars? Uh, Rich mentioned that, uh, but perhaps for New Jersey, uh, for New York, New Jersey spends more per pupil than any state in the country, and vastly more, uh, I have to add, than, than most states. So we should expect, we should be getting um, uh, impressive outcome if we have an efficient system that's converting the input uh, into achievement. Um, and, and again, in the spirit of plain meaning, um, efficiency, efficient, is often uh, defined to, to look at um, uh, what is causally productive, what is marked by the ability to choose and use the most effective and least wasteful means of doing a task or accomplishing a purpose. And, and I would suggest that in education, efficiency has a number of obvious dimensions. We are, of course, talking about fiscal matters and how efficiently are we using the dollars to achieve an outcome. Um, but part of the mix of efficiency is the organizational structure within which we deploy those dollars and try to produce the best possible outcome. Um, and then, of course, the pupil achievement. And beyond that, the learning dimension, the instructional dimension. Uh, are we providing efficient instruction to students in order to maximize their achievement levels? Um, I, I will start to suggest some answers to those questions, but I'm looking forward greatly to the panels where hopefully there will be a much more uh, in-depth focus on these matters. Um, I came to the view, and, and, and uh, I, I'm not recanting my 38-year involvement in thorough education. Uh, it continues to go on. I have been participating in the process that's leading to the hearing, which begins on Monday. I actually deposed one of the state's expert witnesses. Uh, so I'm actively involved in the litigation. I still believe deeply in it. But I have to say, I, I have come to um, have maybe a more uh, uh, subtle view of the constitutional clause. 
uh, because I came to view, and, and uh, this quote comes from an article that triggered a lot of this introspection by me, um, which I did for a conference at Stanford Law School uh, last year. And, and uh, the article is my effort to put together the two pieces. I even use Robert Frost uh, and a metaphor uh, from one of his poems in which he talks about uh, the road most traveled and the road least traveled. Uh, and I apply it to school funding, and I say the road most traveled is clearly in New Jersey, the thorough education road and the road less traveled is the efficient system of free public schools road. So this quote is from that article. Um, and it is that the efficient system language constitutes a bridge between sufficient resources and educational achievement, between the inputs and the outcomes of public schooling. Um, and we have, uh, without doubt, I think, uh, obtained sufficient uh, resources for the schooling of children in our poor urban districts. Uh, I, I think that's beyond dispute. Uh, there's a, a, a continuing question, however, of how effectively we're bridging between those uh, more than sufficient resources um, and the educational outcomes. And you know, at another time, I could uh, talk with you uh, about why I think we're showing some uh, good results, some good outcome, but it's still not at the point we'd all like. Now, let me suggest to you, and this is culled from a lot of sources, a lot of court opinions in New Jersey and elsewhere, uh, from a broad literature having to do with productivity. But if one starts to get real about these concepts of an efficient system of free public schools, what does system mean? What does efficient mean? Um, here's the start of a list. Um, it's a school district structure that maximizes economy and educational effectiveness. And I think in, in substantial part, that will be the conversation in the, the first panel this morning about consolidation. There is the notion, and, and this is a broadly held notion across the country, perhaps honored more in the breach than the observance, that uh, an efficient system of free public schools um, must include substantial uniformity among districts and even among schools. That there have to be efficient procedures both at the state level and the local level that minimize waste and duplication and mismanagement and political uh, interference, but they have to do more than that. They, they, it's not just a screening mechanism to get rid of the obvious negatives. It's got to be a positive mechanism to encourage both at the local and at the state level uh, productive and effective behaviors. But the list goes on. Um, a comprehensive statewide data system, and New Jersey Smart is showing the possibility of that emerging. I don't think it's emerged fully yet. Uh, I've been working a lot uh, with the Newark School District in recent months, um, dealing, among other things, with data. And I'll, I'll put in a quick plug. Uh, you'll be among the first to know we have not yet publicly launched it. Uh, but we're working to launch in a few weeks uh, something we have called the Newark Schools Research Collaborative which will be a three-cornered collaborative among the Newark Public Schools, uh, Rutgers University in Newark, and particularly the Institute on Education, Law, and Policy, and the Newark Charter School Fund, which is an entity that many of you may not even be aware of. It's been in existence for less than a year. Uh, it's a powerful player. It's a charter school, uh, in effect, a mini foundation, um, very firmly committed to charter schools being public schools. It, it is not charter schools being uh, a vehicle or a lever to get the vouchers and privatization. Uh, the word public is very uh, strongly underscored in the lexicon of the Newark Charter School Fund. But um, so I've been working a lot on these matters. And not surprisingly, what's our first big project? to create an effective database, which would include all students in Newark, 
whether they're enrolled in charter or public schools, the ability to track them um, in terms of pupil achievement and other measures, because you can't really take a serious look at what's going on and figure out a better way to do it without an adequate database, so that's crucial. Um, next item is effective monitoring, assessment, evaluation, technical assistance, um, and as necessary, intervention by the state. Um, not through some cookie cutter model, but a very particularized approach to intervening selectively and carefully. Um, uh, I've been involved since 2002 with what emerged as New Jersey CUSAC. Hopefully that will point the way, although I think it, uh, there are some fine tuning points to say the least that are required. But we're not finished with the list. Um, uh, we're still talking about elements of an efficient system of free public schools. Uh, I think we need to have a system in which funding is earmarked for educational programs that work. Uh, and that, frankly, is going to be one of the fighting issues about the school funding, uh, school finance reform act. Uh, because it, it is primarily a kind of block grant program to local districts. Uh, it, it seeks to eliminate not only the Abbott districts, but the programs that have been devised uh, for the Abbott district, some of which have worked very well. I suppose you could say early childhood uh, survives that uh, in the new school funding statute, but I think it reflects uh, a, a quite different philosophy of how to direct state aid to districts. Um, I, I think an adequate state program of research and development is crucial. I think it's an area uh, which has not gotten the kind of attention it should. Uh, and finally, an adequately staffed and effectively organized department. Because again, in, in my view, legally and pragmatically, the key to a lot of this is what happens at the state level and, and through the state education department. Uh, Bill Labrera was fond of saying, and probably Dave Hespy said it as well, um, th that the department uh, increasingly has been overmatched by the challenges. Uh, Bill said at one point, um, we've got 40% more responsibility than we used to have, and we have 40% less staff, so the gap is 80%. Um, now, public education is the enterprise that spends more money by far than any other state service. It's a third of the state budget. It's over half of the budget of most uh, municipalities. Um, there are tens of billions of dollars being spent on education. Uh, it seems to me we're being penny-wise and pound-foolish if we think the way to economize is cut the Department of Ed so it doesn't have the staff and the capability to administer an effective statewide system of free public schools. Uh, so I think uh, a question for today, it seems to me, and, and you can augment the list. You may think some things don't belong on my list and others do. But I think we need to start asking ourselves in a very searching way, what are we actually doing? What's actually in place? Which of these elements are we confident? We can say, yes, we've done that, we have that, let's go to the ones we haven't. Um, it will come as no surprise to those who know me, and it's good to see so many old friends and so many friendly adversaries uh, from these decades uh, in the wars and in the trenches. Um, but I'm, I'm not here to say nice things and pat you all on the head. I hope I'll say some nice things and I hope I'll pat some heads. But my point is really to, to lay down a challenge. So uh, I'm going to wind up my presentation um, with a series of provocative questions. Now, um, some of them won't surprise you. Some of them are already anticipated by what I've, I've said. Um, but let me start from the top. Um, has the legislature or has the department ever adequately defined the Constitution's efficient system requirement? And I do consider it a requirement. In the same way as thorough education has become a clear state constitutional obligation, I think so too should the efficient system language suggest a clear state requirement. Um, there are efficiency standards that have been floated. Most of them look to me like they're dollar amounts for particular programs. 
I don't know that the state has ever systematically addressed what it takes for this huge and costly state system to be truly efficient. Um, and, and I'll just say about that, that those of you who are familiar with uh, school funding litigation will know that in 1973, the first New Jersey Supreme Court decision uh, in the Robinson phase of the case, the court said, you know what? We can't really decide whether the funding formula is constitutionally sufficient because the state has never defined what a thorough and efficient education means. The state eventually responded to that by adopting the core curriculum content standards. So they responded educationally and said, here's what students should know. And the plaintiffs, the Education Law Center uh, and its clients, uh, and the state agreed that that was a, a, an appropriate, constitutionally adequate definition. Ever since, that has been the state definition of thorough education. I don't think there's a counterpart in place uh, as a definition of an efficient system of free public schools. And I'm suggesting I think we need one. Uh, we desperately need one. Without a definition, uh, in the same way as the court said, how can we figure out whether the money's sufficient, the money's being allocated properly? Uh, so I think we can't really decide whether we have an efficient system of education. Uh, until the responsible organ of government, uh, the state education department, maybe the legislature, truly define in, in real uh, operational terms what we need to be efficient. Um, and, and as I've suggested, I think that has multiple dimensions. Can we have an efficient system of free public schools if we continue to rely heavily on a local property tax base system of raising money for the schools. Um, I think it builds in enormous stresses that will impede the effort to create a truly efficient statewide system of education. And I suspect uh, in the particular context of consolidation, uh, you'll hear that that's uh, a problem. Um, this is a, a more obscure point f drawn from uh, the Robinson uh, opinion of Chief Justice Weintraub in 1973. But he, when confronted with evidence about this funding system, he was led to say, you know what? What this is at bottom is really a challenge to the way we've historically allocated uh, responsibility for services and the funding of it, we've tended to rely heavily uh, on localities. And he said, maybe that worked all right when there was a reasonable match between local resources and local needs. He said, but now we don't have that match. We have a colossal mismatch. We have the greatest needs in the municipalities that seem to have the least resources. So he said, I'm not prepared to address that yet, because I don't think this is the right case with the right uh, evidentiary record. But isn't that underlying this whole issue of how we produce a thorough and efficient system of education? Can we do it with the kind of reliance on localities for funding and otherwise um, that we have wound up with? And, and I think it, it's an issue that has to be addressed in the context of efficiency, maybe even more than it had to be addressed in the context of thoroughness. Um, I have to keep remembering to flip. Um, you know, there was a funny moment. I, I don't know whether uh, Commissioner Davey is here. I haven't seen her, but I'm sure there are department people. Um, Commissioner Davey testified at a legislative hearing uh, over the new school funding. Uh, bill in the, uh, the waning days of uh, December, the lame duck legislative session that adopted it. And one of the legislators said, well, uh, uh, Commissioner, can you tell me exactly how many school districts there are in New Jersey? Uh, and Commissioner Davey turned to one of her aides and they whispered a little bit. And the commissioner, I, I don't want to put words into her mouth, so I'll paraphrase, said something like, well, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, because if you look at the department website, these are the numbers you find. 
that we have 616 school districts, of which 593 are operating, uh, 23 are non-operating. We've got 56 charter schools, and in some sense, each charter school functions as a district. So, um, And then you look at the school boards. I, I have not looked at it recently, but they have a different number. I think they have 606. So it's in the 600s. And if you count charter schools, it's nearing 700. Um, does an efficient system of free public schools require that all districts be K-12? to Well, the state seems to be arguing that in the statutes in and around the executive county superintendents. There's a notion that at least the default ought to be every district is a K-12 to district. Um, I, I haven't seen the latest numbers. I think about 40% uh, of our school districts are much less than that. I think, I think only a couple hundred uh, of our 600 and some school districts are, are K to 12. Um, so I, I think that's a kind of threshold question. Uh, are we inefficient because we have too many undersized school districts? Now, those are fighting words. I know that. Uh, and the New Jersey School Board Associations, one of the co-sponsors. Uh, I suspect those are fighting words between me and Mike, maybe not. Um, uh, the executive county superintendent statute, as you may be aware, requires by about a year from now, spring of 2010, that the executive county superintendents um, make, uh, submit plans for consolidation and shared services. But as I read it, the executive county superintendent has no authority to mandate consolidation or shared services. So it's going to be um, uh, an exhortation, uh, a request. Uh, maybe there'll be a little arm twisting. Um, and, and if I leave you with nothing else, I, I, I mean, I want to leave you with a couple of things today. Number one is the need to get serious about realizing an efficient system of free public schools. Two, the desirability of doing that through some voluntary consensual process. But three, it is a constitutional imperative. And I think, therefore, if the voluntary consensual process doesn't work, and it, everything I know about it suggests it is not working and probably won't work, I am old enough, maybe there are a few others in the room, to be old enough to remember the Mancuso Report of 1968 or 9, uh, named after Ruth Mancuso, then the, uh, the head of the State Board of Education. Uh, and I don't think that was the first, but it proposed consolidation, said there's no substitute for it. We need to do something with this crazy quilt of school districts. Uh, about once every decade since, some commission or another has come up with similar conclusions. Um, it hasn't happened. In the middle 1900s or a little earlier, there were over 100,000 school districts in, New in the United States. There are now something on the order of 15,000. New Jersey actually has substantially more school districts now than it had at that starting point when there were 100,000 in the country. So either we know something the rest of the country doesn't know, uh, or we're simply unable to address certain realities. And, and look, to be honest, and, and I, I don't want to rattle the saber too strongly, I just want to rattle it a little bit. Do you think that the level of funding in our poor urban districts would be where it is now if we'd left it to a voluntary consensual process? Uh, I don't think so, but I'm biased. Uh, the question is, do we want to come back in 40 years for another conference like this and say, well, we now have, we've now passed the 700 mark in school districts, and we really should be doing something about it. And you guys get out there and start agreeing. Um, so. Uh, couple more slides and uh, I will leave it to you. Um, uh, does the department have the capacity, whatever number of districts emerge, let's say there's some 
consensual consolidations. And we wind up with 600 instead of 623 or 616 or whatever. Um, does it have the, the, the capacity to oversee and monitor and provide technical assistance and intervene if it needs to be uh, done to create a meaningful state system, an efficient state system? Um, and let me throw out and, and not really dwell on, a lot of people continue to be frustrated or even outraged by the fact that the bifurcation, the, the incredible number of school districts, the small size of them, has contributed mightily to the embarrassing racial imbalance in our schools. And, and one of the benefits, in my view, uh, of consolidation would be it would create uh, a much higher order of feasibility that we could actually racially balance our schools. Now, just one editorial comment. Without fear of contradiction, New Jersey has the strongest state law in the country requiring racial balance in our schools wherever it's feasible. The New Jersey Supreme Court in the Morristown case in 1971 said not to have racial balance where it's feasible to achieve it is a denial of thorough and efficient education. So I would say, can we have an efficient system of free public schools in New Jersey which is not racially balanced to the extent it is feasible for it to be racially balanced. And so, as you probably know, the Jenkins case said, district lines are no barrier to the commissioner's power to order uh, things that would achieve racial balance, and the commissioner actually created the Morris School District uh, as a result, blending uh, Morris Township and Morristown. So I, I just throw that out as a, as a supplemental point. Um, if New Jersey is not providing an efficient system of free public schools, what can or should be done about it? Um, and I've suggested that I'm, um, I'm a skeptic that <clears throat> further legislative or administrative action is going to be sufficient to cure the problem. Now, late breaking news on, the, on a front I know a little bit about, which is can we yet again go to the court and press it into service and say, hey, we've got a constitution. We've got a constitutional requirement. It's not being satisfied. You can't tolerate that. Well, in, in a kind of unlikely, or from an unlikely source, the land of Sarah Palin, comes a decision Wednesday, two days ago, by a judge in, uh, in Alaska in, in an ongoing case, which is partly a school funding case, it's partly a challenge to high stakes testing for students who haven't been fairly educated to pass the test, um, uh, the Moore against State of Alaska case. Alaska has a stripped down version, as I mentioned earlier, of New Jersey's constitutional provision. It's simply obliged to maintain a system of public schools. And the Alaska judge, having heard a lot of evidence, and, and incidentally, for those of you who know the players, you'll find it interesting. Um, there was a battle of experts, as there always is in these cases. And the experts for the plaintiffs, those who felt that Alaska was not satisfying the Constitution, was Linda Darling Hammond. Um, and the expert for the state, as he often is, was Jim Guthrie. Um, and Linda Darling Hammond clearly trumped uh, Jim Guthrie um, uh, because the judge decided her way. And, and what did the, uh, the judge found? That the state of Alaska, and that really meant the state education department, was in non-compliance with its constitutional duty. It had failed to maintain a system of public schools. And what did the judge focus on? And, and as you're reading those, or as I'm uh, repeating them, think New Jersey. Would New, how would New Jersey fare in terms of whether each district's curriculum was aligned with state standards? And what the judge meant was, is the state playing an active role in ensuring that? Secondly, does the state accountability system extend in meaningful ways to content areas not covered by the state test? Is the state intervening effectively to ensure teacher capacity, 
particularly in what the court referred to as chronically underperforming districts. And in general, did the Department of Education have sufficient capacity to monitor and, if necessary, intervene successfully? Uh, and I want to wind up with a quote which is from the court decision, but actually it's from Linda Darling Hammond and her testimony. And I think one should evaluate this, consider whether it has some application to New Jersey. Because the quote is, a more efficient state system operates when the state is able to fulfill its responsibilities well and doesn't leave that to every little local district because the state hasn't provided some of the foundation that's needed for the districts to be able to proceed effectively. Um, and I think that's as good a way to conclude my remarks uh, as I can. I think the challenge is great. The opportunities are great. Uh, we have one point, almost 1.4 million students in our public schools in New Jersey who await your answer. Thank you. I, I don't know whether time permits. Uh, the plan was for there to be some opportunity for questions. We're going to change the panels. While we're changing, let us give uh, Paul a couple minutes for some questions if there are any. So feel free to ask Paul a question, and we'll get the new panel set up there. I can't possibly have been so clear and complete. <laughs> so don't be bashful. Yeah. It, it, I'm sorry, if, if the Constitution had used the word education? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, let, let me think about that. I'm not sure it would have made a difference. I don't think that's been really the front and center issue. Uh, yeah. Just as an example, something like racial balance is inefficient. It's still worth pursuing. It, uh, now, my point is racial imbalance is inefficient, uh, and therefore we have a constitutional compulsion uh, on that basis as well as others. And New Jersey is one of two states in the country that has an explicit constitutional provision that prohibits segregation in the public schools. So there are non efficient methods that are still worth pursuing. No, no, I'm saying I, I think the overriding requirement is part of efficiency and thoroughness of education. Uh, I think there are ways to accomplish that that are consistent with an efficient system of schools. Yeah. Don't you think that uh, in order to determine if you have an efficient system, you have to ask the question of the constituencies whether it's efficient on a consistent, ongoing basis? I, I see in the New York school system they implemented survey systems where they survey students, teachers, and parents annually right. to their impression of their climate in their particular school district. Isn't that an absolutely essential requirement to determine efficiency, that you have to ask the participants whether it is efficient? Um, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's an important, maybe essential part, but not the totality of it. And certainly not everything. Right. Right. Yeah, and, uh, and I think that would go a long way if you're going to measure efficiency, if you're going to look at you have to measure are we efficient? Are we doing what the families think is appropriate? Is it delivering the services that we want? Right. Well, no, I agree. Uh, in fact, it, it, in connection with the, the research collaborative I mentioned earlier, a group of us went out to Chicago to talk to the University of Chicago people who've been doing this since 1990 in, in combination with the Chicago Public Schools. Um, and, and for years, almost from the start, they have done an annual or biannual survey of parent, teacher, student attitudes about the schools. Not, not that that necessarily provides 100% accuracy or full information, but important baseline. And we're going to do the same thing in Newark, and I, I think the idea would be appropriate at the state level as well. That would be a perfect state level initiative, because that way you could have common questions asked throughout the 
Right. And then we just have baselines throughout all districts. Right. Yeah, up in the back. Well, uh, yeah, Joe. My crystal ball over the years is getting more and more cloudy, but um, I, I think the, uh, the School Funding Reform Act, um, in my view, is a, is a big step backwards. Uh, I think it's probably, in some ways, not as good a piece of legislation as the CIFA legislation, which was struck down in 1996. Um, there are lots of technical and some not so technical reasons for that, but. We're going to have to wait and see. Uh, Judge Doyne in Bergen County was designated by the Supreme Court to conduct an evidentiary hearing. Um, uh, he plans to do it six days a week and complete the hearing by the end of February, which is really heavy lifting, and has promised to uh, issue his uh, report, recommendation, opinion by the end of March. It will be back to the New Jersey Supreme Court. So I, I suspect sometime by, by late spring, early summer, uh, we're going to have a, a decision of the court uh, about it. I, I should only say that what the Supreme Court did in November when it considered the state's request to validate the, uh, the statute was to say that um, uh, there's clearly a substantial burden on the state to justify that it, the statute is um, constitutionally sufficient. And that's special to these kinds of cases. That is, normally when a legislature adopts a statute, it has a presumption of validity. The burden is on somebody challenging the statute to prove that it's not constitutional. In this case, it's actually the reverse because the legislature is responding to a constitutional mandate.